Between the Sprockets is brought to you by ComCopy, for duplication specialists. And welcome to In Between the Sprockets, the movie and video review show with a bent edge. I'm Robert Ellsworth. Ah, what the hell did you do that for? I was just trying to scare you. Oh, you didn't do a very good job. Just trying to get you in the mood for our review of species, because the movie itself won't frighten you very much. No, I disagree, but what other goodies do you have in store for us tonight? Well, our video review segment is rabid. Marilyn Chambers' only legitimate movie debut. No, I thought the gangbanging behind the green door was pretty legitimate. Uh, you should have seen the smile on her face. <laughs> that was rigor mortis, dear. And we've also got an interview with... Rick! Rick! No, no, we've done him. Uh. We've got an interview with Patricia Rosemer, the charming Canadian director of When Night Is Falling. And talking of charming Can Canadians, we're going <laughs> to look at the blonde, leggy, model-turned-alien in the sci-fi flick, Species. Species! Yes, and we'll also be looking at Johnny Depp's new film, Don Juan DeMarco, starring the portly Marlon Brando, who's about as big as Tasmania now. So don't touch that dial. Coming up next, When Night Is Falling. Excuse me. Can I talk to you for a moment? Oh, yeah. Uh, Tim, can we call it a night? Uh, Petra, before we call it a night, I have an idea I'd like to try. And my idea is. Uh, okay, it's a night. It's a night. Go. When Night is Falling has already proved to be hugely popular at film festivals throughout the world and also in its home city of Toronto in Canada. It recently took out the Audience Award for the most popular film in the Melbourne International Film Festival and it was closely followed, incidentally, by Antonio Bird's Priest. So let's hear it for queer films directed by female directors. Oh. It's actually Patricia Rosemer's third film following the hugely funny and successful I've Heard the Mermaid Singing. And the hugely unseen White Room. In fact, I think we're the only two people in the world that saw that movie, I'm yeah. sure of it. Just spare on me, which is a shame because it does have a lot to recommend it, but it seemed to be that a lot of people were expecting another Mermaids and found it quite perplexing. But with Rosamu's new film, When Night Is Falling, we see her back in the same style and form of her quirky um, mermaids, I think. Mm, it has that same light touch, but it also has a lot more budget attached. In fact, Rosamu herself has said that she feels that the time was right for a mainstream feeling lesbian film. And she succeeds um, bringing in the elements of a lush Hollywood romance to this film with two women in the lead. So let's have a look at a clip.
The plot is quite simple. A Calvinist teacher meets a circus performer and the ensuing romance turns all her ideas of love and passion on their head. It then becomes the usual dilemma over which should she choose? A life of respectability with her supposed fiancé or life without safety nets with the gorgeous mm, Petra? Well, as for the style, Rosamund brings her usual high production values to the fore. It's beautiful. Mm, as we've come to expect, there isn't a single wasted frame in this film. The plot is a little bit on the thin side for me, but it's definitely compensated by Rosamund's fine direction and the beautiful production values. And the two female leads have fantastic chemistry, so I'm going to give it a seven and a half. Mm -hmm. Well, I came out of the screening and overheard somebody else say it was overbaked, and I have to agree. I mean, we see so many of these lusciously photographed lesbian films with beautiful women and funny little stories with happy endings and cute little dogs. I'm just over it. You know, bring back the lesbian serial what? killers. What? What? Yeah, you're right. I'm like, yeah, yeah. it's a fairy tale. I loved it. I'll go and see it again and again and again. I give it ten. Again again. I have seen it again and again. I give it a ten. And coming up next, forget Richard Gere. This week's interview is with Patricia Rosma herself. But with this film, uh, there was quite a lesbian plot to mermaids, and um, but this is much more central to the film. Do you think uh, you've always been described as one of the Canadian filmmakers, and that you seem to come in the breed with? McGaugh and um, Danielle Conn and all those people, but do you, do you think this might change the way you're seen or that people actually call you a lesbian filmmaker first and foremost instead of... They might, they might, I hope not. Um, I hope that that is, doesn't become the primary focus because it hasn't been the primary focus of all of my work. Mm -hmm. um, it shouldn't be the sort of first label that's pulled out when you talk about me, I think. I wouldn't. I really wouldn't want to be limited to doing lesbian stories for the rest of my life, or or have my authority questioned as a filmmaker about um, you know the heterosexual love story or bestiality or whatever I choose to do. You know. It's been quite a long time since. I mean, White Room was 1989, 90? 90, 91. 91. Yeah. And Lobos was 87. What, what have you been doing in the last five years? Um, I've written a few scripts, um, one of which I may be doing next. I did a short film for uh, something called Montreal Vupa, which is a, a compilation film. I, I, I was screened it on television quite recently here. Oh, was it? Okay, yeah. good, because it sort of dis disappeared, unfortunately. And there were really some really. It was a just a distributor's kerfuffle and um, it had some really strong pieces in it. Um, I was sort of, I, I liked mine. <laughs> uh, and then I put, I, I always get so ambitious with these things and I put way too much time and effort into it. And um, so that was one thing. And I've lived a little bit. Oh, that's nice yes. This is, I, I'm um, really bored with filmmakers who um, only know film and only live film and only talk film and only talk to film people and um, so I've uh, sort of traveled and read and lived. Would you describe yourself as a hopeless romantic? I'm specifically asking about um, the bit that why they go through the door at the end of my mates and of Bob and his resurrection. <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually an extremely pessimistic person and quite um, nihilistic. Um, I don't see a hell of a lot of point in any of it. <laughs> the life business. Um, uh, so we may as well have fun while we're here. It's really the only. It's a. It's an. It's a, a peculiarism. It's not even can be married for tomorrow we die. I really go to cinema to. Uh, uh, be cheered up about the world. Um, so that's why. Uh, 
when I that calling is such a lushly romantic yeah yeah sentence. I do I do I mean I do believe that um, that people can find each other and they can find some um, higher level of evolution through knowing each other and <laughs> um, but uh, you know, you all, we all sort of rot in the end, so what's, you know, what's there to be so excited about? Marlon Brando is back, and with a vengeance in Don Juan DeMarco, a beguiling romantic comedy, also featuring Johnny Depp and Faye Dunaway. This movie is truly a gem. It's a story about the need for myth and romance in our mundane lives. The plot concerns a young man who wants to commit suicide by jumping off of a billboard. He claims to be Don Juan, the world's greatest lover, who seduced more than 1,000 women, and I thought I was promiscuous. Devastated by the loss of his one true love, he is ready to end it all when the corpulent Mr. Brando, playing Dr. Jack Mickler, succeeds in talking him down. Well, it's all right, and what if I don't believe you? Um, you know, I'll take your medication. And you may come with me for as long as you like. <laughs> Do I have an agreement? Do I have these 10 days to tell you my story? On the verge of retirement, Mickler has the young man committed and has 10 days to evaluate the delusional patient, offer a diagnosis, and recommend treatment. During the ensuing sessions, Don Juan recounts a poetic and fantastic life which features heaps of adventure and romance, certainly more than this show has to offer. Convinced of the young man's sanity, Mickler is forced to examine the importance of love and passion in his own life as he rekindles the spark long since lost with his wife, played by the charming and effervescent Ms. Dunaway. And I know a lot about pretty coffee cups and I know a lot of facts, but I need to know all about you. You want to know? I want to know what your hopes and your dreams are. I got lost along the way when I was thinking about myself. Don't you need to ask? Depp is devastatingly sexy and captures the Latin lover with perfection. Brando may be as big as a zeppelin, but he chews up the screen with his best performance in years. He's subtle, romantic, and bittersweet. Dunaway is also wonderful. This is one of those films you don't want to end. I give it a 10. Writer-director Jeremy Levin is true original. Run, don't walk to go see this. If there's one film you see this year, this is it. Coming up next, Species. In November of 1974, a small group from SETI, S-E-T-I, Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, used the radio dishes at Arecibo to send out a message to whoever might be listening. They sent about a quarter of a kilobyte, including structure of human DNA, map of our solar system, population of the Earth, you know, helpful facts like that. In January of 1993, Arecibo received a message back from an extraterrestrial unknown source. That's great. Intelligent life beyond this planet. Yes. There were two distinct communications. The first message turned out to be a superior catalyst for methane. We now have the potential to produce an infinite amount of energy from this clean burning fuel. This convinced us that we were dealing with a friendly intelligence. The second message turned out to be a new sequence of DNA with a rather friendly instructions on how to combine it with ours. Here's some technical data on the whole operation. You can get feedback on it from Dr. Baker here. Basically, the new combined DNA sequence was injected into 100 human ova. We got seven to divide. Four petered out. Two were stored in liquid nitrogen. And we allowed one to grow. That's his code name there, Cell. So 
after two hours. One day. Two days. Oh, my God. This growth is amazing. It's a week. It's a girl. Yes, I... We decided to make it female so that it would be more docile and controllable. More docile and controllable, huh? Well, I guess you guys don't get out much. If you crossed Aliens with Models, Inc., you'd have an idea what Dennis Feldman's sci-fi scarefest is all about. Now, this is true. In 1974, a bunch of scientists sent a container out into space with information about us and our DNA makeups. Now, the premise of species is that a message comes back from space, and in it, they give rundowns on their DNA and how to mix it with our own. <laughs> this was definitely not a good idea. The film opens with a cute little girl, and she's a result of this DNA sequence. She's stuck in a glass room, and something truly appalling is about to happen. And that's when the fun starts. Hmm, fun being the operative word. I must admit that through most of this screening, I sat there thinking, this is an elaborate joke, isn't it? Kingsley plays the leader of this experiment and he gathers rather an eclectic crew around him. It's also a bit bizarre casting. There's Michael Madsen in there playing a heartless mercenary. Then there's droopy-eyed Forrest Whitaker, last seen as the raging queen of pret a -Porter. This time around he's playing an empath, which for those of you who don't know what it means, nobody really did. He's a psychic who can feel things. And he does his usual hammy turn in that. And also Alfred Molina's in there. Now you may remember him as Kenneth Hallowell in Prick Up Your Ears. Here he plays a nerdy sort of Harvard type who specializes, wait for it, in cross-cultural behavior. The token female in the film is Dr. Baker, played by Mark Hellenberger, and she's a biologist. And of course, she has the hots for Michael Madsen. Well, do you blame her? But what they don't know is that this little girl, with the help of some nifty special effects, is going to get into a cocoon, mm -hmm. burst out, transformed into, guess what? A 21-year-old gorgeous model? And she's running around Los Angeles, desperate to find a partner. Oh, my God. <laughs> What's the matter? Take it easy. Just relax. There's plenty of time. What is it? Oh, no, I think someone's at the door. Don't go. Please. I want a baby. What? Excuse me? Let's go around the side. If she's successful, she'll propagate a whole new species which will eventually take over mankind. Writer-director Feldman has created a pretty good script. It's ferociously paced, economically set up, and the characterizations are perfect. The special effects in the film are great, but there could have been more of them. Mm, I don't think they are so great. Mm. The main creation was designed by H.R. Giger, and it bears more than a close resemblance to his earlier work on the bitch in Aliens. Unfortunately, the resemblance ends there. To me, species should have been renamed Specious. In fact, it comes, comes across more as a cheap remake of Cronenberg's early film, Rabbit, only with a bigger budget attached. But I've seen some ingenious filming excuses for a gorgeous woman to whip her clothes off, 
but this one takes the biscuit. Nastasha Henstridge is a knockout. She's every straight man's mm -hmm. fantasy. She's a sizzler. She looks like a Playboy bunny on the rampage. Oh, no, but the difference is she can really act. <laughs> I don't think acting was really called for. I mean, yes, she's very attractive, but really, she doesn't do a lot more than that. And the dialogue, I can't decide whether it's consigned to the trash heap or to cult status. Nope, I take that back. It's trash heap all along the way. When Michael Madsen says, let go of her, you... Mm. What he's really meaning is, get away from her, you bitch, and he doesn't have quite the impact. Whatever it takes, right? Hey, I'll spare another war. <laughs> Buddy. It's a sizzling suspense film with black comedic overtones. I loved it. Well, I have to admit, this film kept me on the edge of my seat. I'll give it an eight. I found it pretty funny, but for all the wrong reasons, I'm mm. afraid. Oh, I disagree with you, Madeline. It's an exemplary sci-fi action adventure. It's um, a tour de force of terror, and it's got enough chuckles and plenty of sex for everyone. I give it a nine. To me, I agree with the reviewer who said that the only mystery he could see in it was how come it took so much money at the American box office. I think it has a rotten central premise, derivative twists, and a bimbo for a monster. Fortunately, she doesn't say too much. I'll give it a five. Well, look, anyway, let's check out our video review, which is Rabid, the David Cronenberg film, made in one hell of a movie. Uh, I bet you guys don't know what rabbit means. Affected with rabies or extremely violent, frothing at the mouth, all that. Oh, you would know. But Cronenberg uses both definitions to make an extremely violent woman as a sexual predator film. Marilyn Chambers, who used to be the ivory soap detergent girl before she turned to a porn actress, stars as the infected one, and she's kind of a cross between Typhoid Mary and Countess Dracula. In fact, Cronenberg's first choice was Sissy Spacek, but she wasn't a big enough name at that stage. She hadn't made Carrie yet. Mm. And executive producer Ivan Reitman chose Chambers, and I think he made a good choice. She's quite good in it. Yeah, he did. Do you mind if I get in with you? I've been lying in bed for so long. My body aches all over. I'm so glad I ran into you. Uh, well, I think I'd better be getting out now. <laughs> I'm getting all wrinkly. Oh, no, not yet. You haven't even told me your name. Judy Glassberg. <laughs> What's really strange about this film is that, considering it came out in 1977, that it prognosticated the whole AIDS virus um, hysteria, because like Shivers' first film, it deals with a sexually transmitted and highly contagious disease. Well, in fact, Cronenberg disagrees with that um, analogy, and when this film did come out, it got a lot of backlash from feminists, like all of Cronenberg's films have, because of its portrayal of female sexuality as being predatory. Oh, no, 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 no. It's all tongue-in-cheek, or tongue and armpit, so to speak. Because the lovely Marilyn has this phallic-type projectile that slithers out from ar her armpit whenever she gets excited. In fact, it looks like a sphincter with a needle coming out of it, I mean. Ooh, yucky. Let's have another look. Uh, cool. Does 
gonna hurt. This is pretty well the first time that Cronenberg was given any budget to play with, and quite a nice job he does too. The cinematography is great, and the acting is surprisingly good as well. Yes, Marilyn Chambers is quite good, and I'm surprised she's never done another legitimate film since then. And she doesn't even take her clothes off that much. Well, the plot concerns itself with Chambers, who ends up at an experimental plastic surgery clinic run by the crazed Dr. Kelloy, where once there she contracts some kind of strange virus which makes her crave blood and sex. Sounds like some fun I know. But it's a typical wild foray into the twisted psyche of Cronenberg. It's a disgusting film. Rant it. This is classic Cronenberg with his usual themes of um, experimental medical institutes, sexual disgust, social order collapsing. It's quite repulsive and very bleak. I loved it. Well, that about wraps it up. See you next... Are you alright? Yeah, I've got this funny feeling in my shoulder. Let me have a look. Oh my God, what's wrong with you? I don't know, I just come over all strange. I feel as if I want to propagate. Have you been taking something funny? Mm, just my new vitamin pills. Have you read the small print? Oh dear. Well, that was Madeline Swain, and I'm Robert Ellswood. We'll see you next week when we'll be looking at A Circle of Friends with the dweebish Chris O'Donnell and Liza Minnelli in her best film, Cabaret. See you then. Good night. Good night. And I'll be here with my new children. We'll be giving away some gift packs to the hot movie species if you give us a call at 03-9510-5592 on Tuesday, August 8th, between 11 and 11.30. Good luck.